everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the first ever virtual Oregon Teen Science Cafe. My name is Dr. Kristen, and I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today. The essence of science and technology is to connect people. In order to do that, we need to be effective communicators. Now, we're going to be listening into an interview that I was honored to have with Maximilian Alvarez. He is a master at storytelling, and I'm really excited to debut him to you all today. This is my best friend, Max. He is a writer, a podcast, is that how you call people that do podcasts? That's, how, that's is, what we call ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> he is finishing up his PhD, so we will be able to call him a doctor soon. He is a gem in my life. I'm really privileged to have him as my best friend, and I'm really excited I get to introduce Max to all the kids in Oregon. So without further ado, this is my buddy Max. So what do you do now? What pays your bills now? So what pays my bills now is, is not grad school. Um, I was, uh, I was a, a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Michigan, where I've been for the past seven years. Um, and then this time last year, um, I was applying for academic jobs. I was really, I always wanted to be a professor. I was really hoping to stay in, in ac academia. Um, but things in academia aren't particularly great right now. So, um, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough to land a job uh, in journalism as an editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education, where I'm an editor at the opinion section. So mm -hmm. I moved from Michigan to uh, Baltimore here, um, the D.C. area where the Chronicle's offices are. And, uh, yeah, my, my day job is is pretty cool. I get to reach out to all sorts of people who are involved in the world of higher education and try to get them to write opinionated pieces uh, about different facets of what happens at universities, uh, what the future of universities are, and all that good stuff. So that's, that's what pays the bills. Like podcasting pays a little bit of the bills. That's more like extra, but, um, but that's my passion project. But uh, yeah, it seems to be working so far. Yeah, so what are you doing your PhD in? Is it journalism? It is not. Um, so that's that's kind of one of the, the funny things is, um, you know, I, I have no formal training in journalism whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I always considered myself a writer and a, a lover of reading. Like, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I was um, this kind of chubby, awkward lover of literature. I would just devour anything that I could read. And then I got into high school and I was in playing football and basketball and track, and I thought I was too cool. So I kind of stopped reading, like, you know, for fun for a couple years. Um, but then when I got to college, I really rediscovered my love of reading literature and history and nonfiction and all that good stuff. And, and yeah, I just, I just kept writing. Like, I think for a long time I wanted to be, like, a novelist, and so I tried, I tried my hand at that. I wrote some short stories and stuff. But then you know, as, as life happened and I, I think I got more life experience and, and I, I was forced to grow up in a lot of ways that I didn't particularly want to do, but, um, but life, you know, has its own plans. Yeah. I think that, that really kind of pushed me towards different kinds of writing. And so when I was in graduate school, I started doing a lot more kind of nonfiction writing, a lot more essays and articles, um, that really, I would say the biggest inspiration for them was the teaching, was, was working with my students at the University of Michigan. Like I, I love teaching, I love working with students. I think that, you know, we have this idea of um, writers and academics, like that the real, the real interesting stuff, the real research that they do and the writing that they do, that that all happens um, kind of in isolation. Like they're locked in their, little ivory tower they're locked in their room you know with their desk lamp on and they're just writing we, we tend to think of it as a very solitary process <clears throat> but what I found is that I got the most ideas and my ideas became the most interesting 
when I would be talking about them with students, with other people, with people who had their own life experiences, their own expertise, their own, you know, identities and places in the world. And those informed how I was thinking about this or that topic. And so I'm very grateful to my students and to graduate school for for kind of giving me that because that was really where I started to, I think, figure out what mattered most to me as a writer, what sorts of topics I really wanted to write about and and how I wanted to write them, like what sort of style um, I thought was was really me, what was kind of indicative of, of the voice that I was trying to find. And, you know, the so like the first article I ever got published was actually something that was originally a very long email to my students after a particularly heavy day in class where we were talking about the 2016 election and there was a lot of stuff going on there. A lot of students had a lot of feelings about seeing kind of these, these um, you know, political divides emerging in the country. And so I wrote this long email to them about, <clears throat> you know, why it was important to, to think critically about the things we were discussing in class and why that was so important for like understanding the political world that we're in now. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up sending that to a publisher, uh, to a magazine, and they, they, they published it. And so I've kind of kept doing stuff like that um for for the past i would say five six years now and it was always like a, a secondary thing um that i would do when i wasn't working on my stuff at grad school um and it, it was really i think a life-saving outlet for me writing has always been a life-saving outlet even when i was an awkward you know little kid who didn't know how to i think articulate my feelings to my parents or to my friends writing was was the way that i was able to articulate them to myself first um and so you know that's that's really my training as it were um and then i just ended up getting lucky i think a lot of it has to do with luck i ended up finding publications that really liked my stuff that wanted to work with me i built relationships with the editors there um i started building more of a of a voice for myself and through that, um, I, I guess I'd built up enough of a resume uh, in like the world of journalism or, you know, more like commentary uh, and opinion writing and essay writing that uh, when, when it came time to apply for jobs, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education thought that I was well suited for the kind of work that I'm doing now. That's really cool. I've always found you really inspirational. To me, writing is one of those things where you're so vulnerable. Like people can read your words and your thought process and they can judge you so much on it. And I think people have a misconception about writing. It's like you're either a good writer or you're not. And I'm finding a lot in my own work that writing takes a lot of time and practice. It's a skill that you need to master. And I think you've done such a great job of like finding your voice and you can just see your purpose and your passion come through your writing. And it's just like, it's very authentic. So I've always just really admired you and your writing that way. Cause it's, it's hard. It's hard to come back to like, if you spent like for me, like I do some writing in the morning and then the next morning I come back and it's like, you're seeing all the things that you did wrong the day before, like glaring your face, and you just have to have a lot of motivation and determination to just like keep at it and keep mm -hmm. refining it. So I've always found that really interesting. So I'm curious, um, how do you manage your time writing? How do you stay motivated? How do you find stories? Well, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, a. Uh, I, I feel like, no writer will have the same answer to that question, which is kind of, it speaks to your, you know, the point that you were just making, right, about, you know, the the creative process and, and kind of what, you know, how it is this sort of, it offers this sort of space for us to be vulnerable, for us to find that authentic voice. And I think that's a really, really important um, point to underline for, for anyone listening here, right? Because, you know, this is this is the thing that, <laughs> no matter who you are, you will never be able to convince yourself that this is like the case when you were going through junior high and high school. It's just not how the world works when you're that age, right? Everyone is trying to figure themselves out. 
everyone is anxious about what everyone else thinks of them and and those two things end up kind of com like converging on you right because you're trying to figure out who you are what styles represent you what things you love to do what things you want to do what sorts of people you want to hang out with right what sorts of impacts you want to have on the world and that's a very that's a huge thing to work with like that's a that's a lot for you know young people to have to figure out at a time when they're also just taking millions of classes, worrying about college, you know, maybe you are coming from, you know, backgrounds where your parents are working, um, you know, maybe you have to work in high school, like there are just so many things going on and so many struggles that everyone is going through at that time in their lives that it's a, it's a whole lot to ask of people young people to to figure themselves out um, and to know what what is authentically theirs and what their wants you know their authentic wants really are because so much of who we are and what we want in high school and junior high is kind of driven by what we think other people think we should want mm -hmm. right and and like i mean that's just natural right because you want to fit in and like i said everyone is everyone is deeply insecure about one thing or another everyone is deeply worried about impressing other people they want people to like them they want friends right they want a sense of purpose that's just part of the of the magic <laughs> the the magical wild you know roller coaster of junior high and high school but it's also it makes it very hard for you to know what you yourself you know really want and you have to really try to dig deep and you have to know who to trust people who know who you are even in ways that maybe you don't recognize, but people who have your best interests at heart, people who know and love you and care about you and your future, um, you have to listen to those people, right? You listen to your family, you listen to your close friends. You know, that's one way that I think you start to figure out who you are and who you wanna be and what you wanna do with your life. But you also, I think, you know, you need to try things out. Like, you know, I was, I was, when I was in high school, I did kind of everything. Like I said, I did football, basketball, track. I did drama, and, and I ended up loving drama, and I never thought I would have. Um, I did the student newspaper. Um, I ended up being in student government in my senior year. And I'm really grateful that, that I did those. And I'm really grateful that I had people like my parents and my best friends to kind of encourage me to do that. Because I don't, I think, you know, I was susceptible enough to the ways that everyone else was kind of pushing their expectations on me that it was very easy to just do something that I didn't necessarily want to do but because I thought I'd be letting other people down if I didn't um, or that this was just what was expected of me and again I'm, I'm really glad that I had kind of um, the support system um, to to kind of encourage me to think more about what I wanted to do and I and I you know, felt very comfortable once I started to discover the things that I love, you know, in doing them, even if, you know, even when I was in drama, I knew that the guys on the football team would make fun of me. But I think like after a while, when I showed that I was like, hey, I really like it. I'm comfortable with that. I don't care, you know, like that you are insecure to the point that you wouldn't want to do it. So fine, you you do you, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do me. This is something that brings joy to my life. I like these are people that I wouldn't have thought to hang out with before and they're fun and they're funny as heck. And so like I, I, it, it takes a long time. I know there's a long way of answering a question, but it takes a long time for you to kind of find those, those authentic parts of yourself, like you said. And I guess I would just encourage people to, you know, it's important to listen to what your peers, you know, are saying, like, you don't, you, you want to, um, you don't want to be a jerk, right, who, who just, like, has no consideration for what other people think. You know, you don't want to be, be mean to other people. You don't want to shut out everyone else's voices. But you also got to balance that with, you know, no, trying, like, caring about who you are and what you want to do um, and really not letting the opinions of other people kind of drive you to uh, not explore those sorts of things. And this is a long roundabout way of saying that, writing is a really great place to, to do that, to help you figure that out. Even if you don't publish it, even if you're just journaling, mm -hmm. right? Even, you know, especially when we're like every day, we're so plugged into TikTok and Twitter and all sorts of social media, everything is moving. 
you know, a thousand miles a second. There's so much information, so much communication that we're doing on a daily basis that it can be kind of hard to actually sit and think about, you know, something for a long period of time. Um, writing allows you to do that. Writing gives you a space to sit down, to try to collect your thoughts, to work out those thoughts, you know, as you go, right? Sometimes you'll cross something out uh, and then you'll rewrite it and then you'll realize that's, that's what I wanted to say. But, I, but you need that practice, right? It's just like when I would go outside in my driveway and shoot hoops, like for, oh, gosh, thousands of hours of my life have been spent shooting hoops outside in my driveway back home in California. And that's how I got better, right? I would, I would use that time to think. I would use that time just to improve my, my playing. I would try new things out when no one was watching. I would, I would imagine like, you know, I, I wanted to be like an NBA player, but I was only five foot nine. So that I gave up that dream after a while. But, you know, I like to think of writing like that, right? It's actually a very forgiving exercise, right? You can, writing is a thing that allows you to get better at it the more you work at it. And the more you work at it, the more that you're kind of working on yourself, right? Because you're tr working to try to articulate and, and meditate on what's going on inside of you, which on a day-to-day -day basis can be, you know, can be very hard to, to put your finger on. Um, and you just kind of act impulsively, not knowing why you said that or why you did this. I think writing is a great place to have that sort of introspection. It's a kind of meditation, right? It's a kind of way of... of caring for yourself and caring for others because you're also if you're trying to write about kind of what someone else is doing or you're trying to create a character in fiction right you really have to try to put yourself in their shoes you really have to try to be empathetic and and imagine what the world looks like outside of your own head right and that's i think that's a really you know important process for all of us to engage in whether or not we want to become like a famous novelist or something. I think it's, I think it's something that we should all practice in one way or another. Interesting. There was something that you said that really resonated with me. You talked about one way of finding your authentic self is uh, surrounding yourself by mentors. And I made me think of back me all the way through middle school. I would not be the person that I am today without having different adults in my life along the way that have like offered advice. Um, so it's really kind of shaped my career journey. It's been very twisty turny because of having a lot of different mentors and it's people that came into my life in surprising ways. Sometimes there weren't always teachers. Um, so I'm curious, thinking back, who were some really positive mentors in your life? <clears throat> I think it's a, yeah, I think it's a really important question, right? Because, you know, it speaks to one of the great lies of our American culture, right? This idea that who we are and, and who we become is only comes from like within ourselves, right? Like that, that we are the authors of our own destiny and no one else but us, like, I get why that's a beautiful dream for people to have, right? We, we, we live in a country, you know, the, where we're always told that you can, you know, uh, that you can achieve greatness just by hard work, right? You know, that, that it's all up to you and, and, you know, what you do and how you pursue your, uh, your dreams and how much effort and blood and sweat you put into them, so on and so forth. I think that there's something in that that's really beautiful that speaks to people, right? We want to believe, like, we can create our own future, like, like that our future isn't set for us, right? Um, and so I, I don't think it's as simple as just saying, like, anyone can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, anyone can create their own destiny. I think that's a lie. But I think that we do have agency. We do have the ability to kind of um, build a path for ourselves. But on the other side of that, it's, it's also incredibly beautiful to think that who you are and who you become, right, is, is also, it's, you are indebted to the people who care for you, who love you, right? The people who, you know, you experience the world with and, and who you got to grow with. You're, you're, wherever you end up, the friends that you had in high school and junior high, the mentors that you had, they're, they're going to leave an imprint on you. 
and that's you know and and that's not to, that's to say nothing of like your family and and the ways that they have cared for you the ways that they have taught you the sacrifices that they have made to get you to where you are now or to give you the sorts of opportunities where you have more agency in the way that you live your life and i think it's i think holding those two things together is really important right having the kind of you know courage and ambition and desire to make your own way but also feeling that kind of you know sense of attachment to you know the people who help make you who you are right we're all dependent on each other in one way or another and i think it's a really it's a really important question to ask about who who those influences were who who shaped us because it trains us to to i guess think of ourselves in that way but I mean, you know, obviously, like I, I love my family very deeply. I, I actually on the podcast, I've had quite a few of my family members. The very first mm -hmm. episode that I ever did of my podcast was with my dad, uh, yeah. who is a Mexican yeah. immigrant. To it. And it was, oh, yeah? yeah, so I, I listened to it when it first came out, but I listened to it um, this week. And it was a very powerful story. Um, your dad was very vulnerable and shared a lot. Um, and something I think I've just learned in the last year about myself is my parents, I think we're always like this superhero, almost like this one dimensional character. And so I'm starting to learn a lot about my parents and their experiences. And so I just thought that was such a really, I don't know. So what was it like interviewing your dad for your podcast? Yeah, I mean, it was... Um... It was an incredible experience, and I guess by by way of answering that, I'll I'll try to give a more concrete answer to your first question. Right? Is like you know my parents were two of those huge um, kind of influences, mm -hmm. and I guess it does link to the podcast, right? Because you know when I think about it, when I think about my family and the Mexican side and the white side of the family, right? You know I came to know them not only just by by being around them but through stories right you know our family i come from a family of storytellers on both sides my on the white side of the family my grandpa's from north carolina where where your family's from and you know he he is like he's just like a the, the amazing like kind of southern um charmer he's got so many stories he he had his first job at the tail end of the Great Depression when he was like five years old. He was he was shagging balls at a golf course uh, at that time. Um, he never made it past the eighth grade, but he he just had so many incredible life experiences. And he traveled between North Carolina and California before there were even highways, right, connecting them. And he hitchhiked his way there. Like, and so hearing about his life. You know, it, that was how I think I really got to know him because it's a lot easier for people to reveal more of themselves through storytelling than when you're just, I guess, asking them point blank, you know, about themselves. Um, and that, I guess that speaks to what I was talking about in terms of writing and why I think it's important for for all of us to try to practice writing in that way because it it, it allows us to open up about those sorts of things. But my parents were a huge influence on me. My siblings, um, I have three siblings whom I love to death. Um, you know, I had a lot of, I had a lot of great friends growing up. Um, you know, I, like everyone else, I had those periods where, you know, I didn't know if I was gonna be in the jock crew, if I was, cause I was a, I was a jock, but I was also taking all the AP classes. So it was like, the jocks called me a nerd and the, uh, the the nerds called me a jock and so like you know I'm sure a lot of folks listening to me can can relate to that um, but again it was it was once I stopped trying to kind of define myself by these sorts of categories that other people were imposing on me and I started realizing well I'm both right I'm, I'm, I'm a jock I'm a nerd I'm a drama kid I'm a newspaper kid like and I I'm, I'm a complex person like everyone else is, right? And, and the more that I came to be proud of that, the more that that, you know, was what I wanted to be, um, the less I cared about, you know, what other people thought of me, right? But to, to go back to your, your question about the podcast, right? So like I said, my, my family, you know, 
revealed a lot um, of our family history through these stories that we would just hear growing up all the time. And like I said, it was it was in those stories that I would learn so much about family members who I knew, but who like my my Theo Chano, right? He's like a, an army vet. Mm-hmm. He was a he was a brawler when he was uh, younger. He would get into a lot of fights, so I always knew him as kind of like the you know the, the the like kind of bulldog of the family, right? He was the tough guy. But in when I would hear the stories that my Theo would tell about him or my dad would tell about him, I got to learn a softer side of him, um, and I got to see him as more of the complex person that he is. Right, not just the kind of limited person that that I knew in my own personal interactions with them, and that really kind of circles back to how I started the podcast, because um, you know the 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 podcast itself, I didn't know that it would grow into what it's become now. Um, I didn't even know if I wanted it to be like an ongoing thing. But I did know that um, I wanted that first episode with my dad to happen because, you know, our family had been through a lot, right? We, uh, you know, like millions and millions of families out there, you know, we lost pretty much everything in the Great Recession, um, which was a little over 10 years ago. Um, You know, that that was a massive global economic event that you know just destroyed the the lives and savings of millions and millions of families everywhere we lost our house the house that i grew up in the house where all of our memories were that was a very hard thing for our family to go through and you know especially with like you know my mom coming from you know a a poor uh white working class family in north carolina Um, her being like the first to, to get a college degree, my dad growing up, you know, dirt poor in Mexico, uh, being separated from his siblings when he was just six, you know, eight years old, um, moving to the United States where he didn't know anyone and he didn't know any English kind of becoming a citizen, right? They, they had gone through a lot and by becoming homeowners and having our family, right, that was kind of like their American dream, right? They they had kind of achieved what their families had sacrificed for, what they had sacrificed for, and then like that, it was all gone, right? Or so it seemed, that's how they, that's how they saw it. That's how we saw it. And, and it was a really devastating thing for all of us. And, you know, I could just see in the, the years after the recession hit, right, how much it was affecting all of us in, you know, kind of these really deep and, and, and traumatic ways, right? We, we weren't talking to each other the way that we used to. We weren't telling stories the way that we used to. Everything was just kind of slow and stuck and sad. We would just watch a lot of TV. We, we really didn't want to open up about what we were going through. And, what was terrible about that is that so many other people were going through the same thing at that very moment. But I think so many of us, again, we, we, we would turn inwards. We would take all of that pain and, and onto ourselves and we would take this kind of global economic event where millions and millions of lives were, you know, upended, but we would still, tell ourselves that it was our fault, that we were responsible for everything that had happened, um, and that if we had just done this differently, all of our dreams would, wouldn't have gone away. And, you know, I think that's, that, that, again, it speaks to, like, you know, the really negative consequences of believing that our lives are, are just, you know, like, that we're the authors of our destinies and no one else, and that we're not in any way dependent on the world around us or the people around us. Again, that's just a lie. And if you want to see how bad, you know, the bad things that that can do to you, look at something like the Great Recession. Look at something like we're going through now. And if you have millions of people who are experiencing a systemic problem together, but all of them are convincing themselves that it's their own personal fault, Right? That's going to cause so much pain, and they're going to take that out on each other, on themselves, on their families, and that's what we were going through. Right? We, we didn't have a way to process what was going on, and you know, along with that, you know, we were doing whatever we could to get by. So my dad was driving for Uber. Um, I was working at 
warehouses and factories and restaurants for you know a few years before I kind of found my way back to grad school. Um, and this was after I graduated college, right? So I got out of college, I thought the future was wide open for me and then bam, <laughs> I got spat out into a recession. And like many of our generation, um, you know, I was left scrambling trying to figure out how I was gonna eat. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed something, you know, at the same time that I could see, like my dad especially, my mom was at least a little more vocal. She would talk to us, her children, about how bad it was or how hard it was. And she would always say like, you know, your dad won't talk to me. Like he's just kind of, he's closed off. It was like, it was like the lights were on, but no one was home. And I really think that just in his own mind, he was just punishing himself for, for having had and lost this infinite thing, right? This, this American dream that, that, you know, he had worked so hard for. And, you know, he's, he comes from, you know, a generation of Mexican men who were not taught to talk about their feelings, were not taught to open up, you know, about these sorts of things. There's a very like machismo aspect to it. And, and I'm very grateful that my dad has been open enough to mainly us, his children and his family at, to that it, we have kind of allowed him to be more open in ways that I think he never could, you know, with, with his coworkers or even his siblings. Um, and so what I started to notice was that as we were all getting more depressed, as we were, you know, working, you know, all these low wage jobs and doing what we could to get by. And as we weren't talking to one another, what started to happen was that my dad, <clears throat> as he was driving Uber, um, he started talking to the people that he was driving, right? You know, just because he thought, you know, he's not a very talkative guy, but I think for him, it was like, if he's on the job, he can be very good, right? Because he, he used to be in real estate. So like, when he's in his element, and he feels comfortable, he can he can be really personable and, and really charming. Um, and I think that when he was driving Uber, he kind of felt like, well, this is part of the job, right? They give Drive, uh, people give you better ratings if you are kind of uh, amicable, amiable, like if, if you make fun conversation. But it was when he would get in those conversations with other people that he would start talking to people who were his age, people who were immigrants like him, people who had lost their houses too, people who had lost everything. People He was driving people his age to their second or third job. And they would talk about this in the, in the car when he was driving them. <clears throat> and I realized that it was only then that he started to think about um, the recession and everything we had been through in terms that didn't just put all the responsibility on himself. He started to realize that he wasn't alone, that it wasn't just him, that a lot of people had gone through this and a lot of people had tried everything they could to salvage their homes and, and everything like that. And it was only then when he started to realize that he wasn't alone, when he started opening up to other people, even if that wasn't what he meant to do in, in going into it, that's when I think he started to come out of his depression. That's when he started to open up a bit more to us. And we started being able as a family to kind of work together to get over this hump. And that, that was really powerful to me because it was like I finally was starting to get my dad back. And, and I started to realize that I was doing the same thing, right? That I was closing myself off, that I had this kind of macho thing going on where I didn't want to talk to anyone about how I had gone to college at a great college. I got, and now I was working at, you know, as a temp in like, you know, 12 hour days at this warehouse. And I felt like a failure. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to tell anyone that. I thought it would make me look weak. I thought it would make me look like more of a failure if I admitted it. Um, but I'm very grateful that my dad and my mom and the other workers that I would talk to kind of help me open up and feel less ashamed of that. And once we started opening up more, I think we felt that there was actually more power in that, that actually we are, we are way less powerful when we're sitting with all of this locked up inside of us because we're not able to connect with each other. We're not able to build that sort of solidarity. We're not able to, um, you know, see that in fact, um, we're not alone in this and together we might actually be able to do more about it. 
right? If you're just home depressed and, and taking all of this burden on yourself, you're, you, you know, you are, you are disempowered in that way, right? You know, you, you, you feel like crap, you don't want to do anything. And I think there's a reason why, you know, we're encouraged to feel that way and not to feel pain in this kind of collective way. And so I wanted, I had that, that's all of the background to me having recording this conversation with my dad, uh, where I just got a recorder. Um, I got a microphone. I called him. I, I told him what I was thinking about. And I told him, I was, I was like, you're going to be my guinea pig. I, I was like, I want to test this out. <clears throat> and he was like, okay. And um, what I wanted to do was just, you know, learn about more, learn more about his life and learn more about what it was like to go through the recession. But honestly, we didn't start talking about the recession until like an hour and 20 minutes into it. Because the first hour and 15, 20 minutes, we just talked about his life. And I learned more about him in that conversation than I think I had like in, in over 25 years of, of being his son. And it was really, it was really profound and incredible to me because he talked about his that growing up in a in a shack in Tijuana, he talked about his mom dying. He talked about coming to the United States and how hard that was, being separated from his siblings. Talked about meeting my mom. There were also a lot of great and funny stories, right, about the jobs that he had and and the places he had been. The two ninety nine um, like steak lobster at, from the Sizzler or something. Oh, I was like. Yes. Yeah, so he he worked. Uh, he met my mom while they were both working at a Sizzler. He was uh, he was a cook, and and my mom was a uh, was a waitress. Um, and you know, it was just, yeah, it was just. It seemed really important to do to hold both of those things in that conversation, right? To not just make the recession and losing our house like the center of the conversation, because that that was kind of already the case right when we talk about all the millions of people who lost their homes and jobs in the recession that becomes the center of the story and then all those millions of people they become just numbers right we become just kind of stats on you know in a new york times article and what i was trying to do with this podcast because what because i had seen it working with my dad when he was driving uber i had seen it working in the conversations i would have with my coworkers was that in fact you know if you make the the human at the center of of everything <clears throat> if you make you know if you talk to your coworkers not just as coworkers but as human beings who have their own complex lives who have been on this earth for maybe longer than you have, who have gone through so many life experiences and have learned so many different things, then you, you know, you make that the center. Then you start to see, you know, the rest of their lives and the jobs that they do and the, the things that they go through, like the recession. You see them in a new light. You start to realize the real human cost, right, of the ways that we treat or mistreat one another, Right. You know, if you're if you're driving in an Uber with some guy who you don't know or like, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe you just form a kind of bad opinion. Maybe you're having a bad day and this guy just isn't he doesn't say hi to you in a really nice way. And you just think, oh, that guy's a jerk. You know, it's very easy to kind of write people off in that way. But once you are kind of forced or if you force yourself to think about how deep and complex all of our lives are and our histories are right? You start to open up new parts of your heart, right? You start to think different things about the people that you're around. And you start to see more, I think, of the injustices in our world. Um, when you realize just, uh, you know, what, what things are lost, you know, like, in, and what parts of ourselves we keep from each other, um, because we only know how to relate to each other in certain ways. Right. And so that's what I mean by saying I didn't want to just make the recession or my dad's jobs the center of the story. I wanted to make him the center of the story and to then fill it out that way. And like I said, he opened up in a way that like he never had. And that was really powerful to me because it told me that like, my God, like how many more people in this country and beyond are just sitting on so much that they want to talk about? Right, are are sitting on so much, so many great stories and so many raw emotions that they're never really given an outlet to kind of uh, articulate. 
or and we're never really given the chance to connect with each other on that level. And I think now after doing three seasons of the show, I've I've seen that a lot. In fact, all of us, right? All of us are sitting on, you know, like if you think about it, you know, you may whoever's watching this, you may be sitting, you know, you may be watching it with, you know, say 10 other people who are, you know, 15 years old, right? You're all the same age, but together, right? That's 150 years of experience kind of put together that you, you are walking past just all those years of, of experiences and stories and knowledge that all of us kind of contain within us. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we never really talk to each other about that stuff. We, we, we never really make that the center of how we connect with one another. And then that leads us to be really reductive, right? That leads us to being like, oh, that, that's the jock, you know, who, you know, is a jerk, but you don't know, you know, about what's going on in their home life, right? You don't know about the second job that they go to, right, after, after football practice or something like that. Right? There's always more underneath the surface, but I think we're all taught um, to never look under that surface, right? And to, and to see that as somehow less valuable or less important, or to, to think that we'll be judged harshly or will appear, um, I don't know, in some sort of negative light if we reveal these things about ourselves. And so it's a very long-winded answer to your question, but like my, my real, the real hope for the podcast Working People right, and the real um, belief behind it, right, is that if you just listen to people, right, if you give them the chance to open up, and if you really show that you are interested in what they have to say and learning about who they are, it's always going to be interesting, right, it's always going to be fascinating, and you're going to feel closer to them and to other people um, than you did before, and it's very easy to not feel that closeness to people when maybe the only way we're interacting with them is through, you know, social media or we're only able to communicate in 132 characters or something like that, right? I'm just, there are all these ways that we're pushed to reduce the complexity of ourselves and our neighbors. And I think that that comes at a great cost. And so the more that we can give that gift to each other and ourselves to open up and to really see each other for the complex human beings that we are, um, and to really try to learn from each other's experience and, and validate and listen, uh, you know, not always, you know, have to say something about it, but just listen to what other people want to have said. Um, I think that we can really achieve beautiful things uh, if, we, if we make that more of a priority in our lives. And that's, that's what I try to do with this podcast. Yeah, it's been really interesting because your podcast, I mean, you've interviewed so many different people. Um, and I like what you're saying, you know, you really have to relate to people and see them as their lived experience. And there's a piece of that where you also have to be very confident and vulnerable with yourself. You need to be able to introspectively reflect on yourself in order to really start to see people on a deeper level. And so I really, love your podcast because I can kind of come at it in different ways. The most recent episodes that were really hard for me to listen to, I really had to pause it a couple of times and just let it sink were the episodes that people were calling in um, during this global pandemic and people that are considered essential workers and are still going out into the world and working to put food on our tables, keep us safe and healthy. And it's it was really humbling. Um, I really had to take a step back and, you know, I have to check my own privilege. I'm able to be at home. I haven't really stepped outside my neighborhood in the last like 10 weeks. And so there's this sense of like, oh, I don't really understand what's going on in the world besides news. But it was just this personal level that really was like connecting with people, people that have different stories, different lives and different lived experiences. Um, especially in a time where you can feel very isolated and you can start to think like, oh, everybody's experiencing things the way I'm experiencing it because it's really hard to really connect to other stories. So I'm curious what interview was probably the hardest for you to do, the most surprising? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I would say that, uh, like you were saying, um, 
So there are probably two answers to this, right? Because there's one that is maybe one of the hardest interviews that I had to conduct. But then I, I would honestly say that those two episodes that I put together on the COVID crisis, that was the, the hardest thing that I put together for the show, right? Because not only was it just a lot of work, right? Because, um, you know, I had to, I had to put together kind of a call for submissions. I had to reach out to labor unions and um, worker groups and political groups and community groups and friends that I knew in other parts of the, the country. You know, I, had to, I wanted to cast a wide net to, to find people, you know, who wanted to share their stories. And then I was kind of overwhelmed with how many people did want to share their stories, right? It goes back to like that episode with my dad. It was like, it was like my dad, who's a, you know, a quieter guy on a day-to-day -day level, as soon as the recorder was on, he opened up and suddenly he was, you know, just talking about all his life in just, you know, such, you know, amazing and funny and heartfelt ways. And I was like, what, like, what, what is it about the fact that you're now being recorded? Like, cause you would kind of think it would be the opposite, right? You'd think that he would be more nervous, but again, it was like, I think it was having that recorder light on what it said was like, someone is going to hear this, right? Like I'm, I'm going to be heard. Whereas for these few years, I feel like, I feel like I haven't been heard, right? I feel like everything I've been going through and thinking and feeling has just been sitting in my gut and I've had no outlet for it. There's a really beautiful, there's something really beautiful and empowering, collectively empowering and personally empowering, but in, in feeling like, you know, our stories matter in feeling like um, our stories deserve to be told in feeling like our experiences are worth listening to. And I think that's a gift. That's a really important gift that we all should give ourselves and, and each other. Uh, and we should practice it too, by, by trying attentively to listen to one another when, when others are, are willing to open up to us, right? They don't have to open up and, and we should never make them open up more than they are willing to. But I think just, just letting others know um, that, that people do want to hear it if they're willing to share. I think that I've been, constantly surprised with the show how much people who I've never met a lot of the times, right? I can be talking to a coal miner, a retired coal miner in Eastern Kentucky who I've never met, who will talk to me for an hour and a half about his life, right? Because he knows, you know, there, there's just something about knowing that, that someone is interested and that other people are going to be interested in hearing it that I think is, is, you know, who wouldn't want that, right? Who wouldn't want to know that, like, the 70-plus years they've been on this earth, you know, like, we're, are, are interesting, they have something to give other people, right? Um, and so when I was putting together the, the COVID episodes, um, you know, I put out this call. I gave people instructions on how to record and how to send in their files, right? I answered a lot of questions from a lot of people who reached out. I was talking to so many different people, Um and it was when, you know, the avalanche of submissions came in. And like I said, it was, it was A, just a lot of labor, like listening to all these uh, clips, editing them, them, them down, because I also wanted to make people feel comfortable. So I said, like, look, like, don't, you're not on a live recording. So if you say, like, um, you know, I'll edit that out, right? If you have to take a space to, to think, I'll edit that out. I'll make you sound good. Don't worry. Right, because that's if you can take care of that, if you can make people feel comfortable that you're not gonna, you're you're gonna do what you can to make them, you know, be the best representations of themselves. That puts them uh, that puts them at ease, and I think that's you know a responsibility that that you have as a as a podcaster, right? Is you have a responsibility not only to yourself and to your listeners, but to the people who are entrusting you with their stories. Um, so all that labor of going through the clips and editing them, deciding, you know, how to break them up. Um, Cause some people would send in clips that were like 50 minutes long and I would have to edit them down to like maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And they would even say, they're like, they're like, you can edit this out, but I just need to say it. Right. You know, they, they knew it wasn't all going to be in there, but again, they just, the fact that no one had given them that outlet up until that point, you know, once they were given that outlet, you know, it just all came out and it just confirmed for me, right, how important it is to give people that outlet. And um, 
you know, on, on these COVID episodes, like I'm not, I'm not in them, right? Like they're all just the voices and testimonies of workers and organizers that I piece together. Um, and listening to those and talking to the people behind them um, and spending just so many hours on those episodes was was way more emotionally and psychologically taxing than I think I had anticipated, mm. right? I mean, I mean, there's some beautiful stories in there. There's some funny stories, right? There's a, there's a UPS driver who's like hilarious and adorable. And he's like, he's got like eight kids and, and he's just got a really f- way of talking. Like he was great, but then there were also gig workers who like would deliver food for Instacart and stuff like that who were immunocompromised, who were especially vulnerable to the virus and who wanted more than anything to stay home because they were terrified of getting sick or terrified of getting others sick, but they couldn't because they didn't have the economic means to and Instacart didn't pay enough and our, you know, the world that we live in doesn't provide enough of a safety net for people in these sorts of situations that, you know, this person had to risk her life uh, just to keep food on the table and you could just hear the terror in her voice and that was very hard you know to to listen to and and to talk to her about that um but again it speaks to i think the the power of giving people's like amplifying people's voices feeling like we together have a space to share our stories when by and large we we kind of don't in the mainstream media right i mean like you're you're not going to see much of like if you watch the news maybe you'll there'll be like a 2 minute segment on like a you know gm plant worker or you know a mcdonald's worker or something like that that really reduces their lives and experiences to like a sound bite right but it's much harder to find a place where you can actually talk about everything else that's going on like not just that you're scared not just that you wish you could stay home but where you have a little more time to kind of you know talk just work through the feelings that you are feeling at that moment like just vocalize the fear that you are feeling vocalize the um how much you miss seeing other people right it's just it's just an open space for people to express themselves in ways that they felt like they couldn't in other parts of their lives. And, and, you know, I just, I think it, again, it speaks to the mission that all of us should have, uh, to, that all of us should take up in one way or another um, to unlock all of that, all those, you know, feelings and thoughts and experiences to establish that kind of connection with our friends and family and neighbors and coworkers and people we don't know. Right to kind of find each other in those ways that on a day-to-day basis we just don't do. Right, I think now when we're all locked inside and missing those sorts of connections even more, we realize how much they mattered and how much we depended on them. Right, all along. And so I guess I would say like the COVID episodes were the hardest things that I had to uh, do for the podcast. The hardest, you know, uh, episodes that I put out. Um, the hardest interview may have been, um, back in the first season when, um, I was talking to uh, an Amazon warehouse worker, uh, in Texas who, um, ended up living out of her car after she got injured on the job and Amazon, the, the behemoth that we all depend on, who's, you know, founder is going to be a trillionaire while all of us are worried about how we're going to pay our rent you know she she ended up living out of her car after she was injured on the job and amazon had a very terrible workers comp policy and workers comp is basically just your employer's responsibility for getting you the health the treatment that you need when you are injured doing the job that you have been hired to do for them right and so basically what amazon did was like they just gave people to run around, they would send them to these doctors that they had partnerships with who would always try to kind of tell the workers like, oh, you're fine, or just take these opioids and you'll be fine, right? They, they didn't care about their workers at all. So anyway, I talked to this woman, again, who I'd never met, who was living out of her car for a long time, and she just, she opened up about um, her traumatic upbringing with like, you know, an abusive stepmother, she talked about like meeting her first husband and the pain of going through a divorce with him 
um, after, you know, he cheated on her and all that stuff. Like, and again, we didn't even get to her work at Amazon until like after an hour into the interview, but it was just so difficult um, in the moment to kind of um, hear how painful this was for her and to think, it was like, you know, you, you, this woman was, you know, twice my age, right? And she was still breaking her body working at Amazon. Um, and she even said in the interview, she was like, you know, she started crying and she, she said, you know, I've never, I haven't told anyone this in like 20 years. And again, it wasn't, it wasn't that I was like, it's, it wasn't that it was like just hard to listen to, although it was, but what really broke my heart was I was like, you've been sitting with all of this inside and no outlet for it. No one to listen to you for that long. Right. That, that just, you know, it makes me really sad to think of, you know, all the pain that she went through feeling like she couldn't talk to anyone about that. Um, and, and kind of how wild it was that someone she had never met who just said, Hey, I want to listen to you for two hours. Uh, was was all she needed to to talk about it as openly as she did. Wow. I think what you're doing is really transformative. I'm going to do a super hard pivot, though, because we've talked a lot about your PhD. <laughs> pivot, baby. <laughs> um, we haven't really talked about your college experience. There could be a lot of kids that are going to watch this that um, are thinking about going to college. Um, they may be first generation, so they may not know what kind of things to consider. Um, so I'm curious, when you first, after high school, how did you pick where you went? How did you pick your majors? What surprised you within your first <clears throat> years of being a college student? Yeah, a lot, <laughs> I guess I would say. Is, um, you know, my, my brother, Zach, and I were the first two to move away from California to, to go to college. And that was, that was quite scary. But I, I was fortunate because, um, you know, I had always wanted to go to Harvard. I had always wanted to be a, a medical doctor, like since I was like seven, right? I think I just, yeah. I was, I'd watched a movie or maybe I read a book and I was like, mom, I want to be a doctor. And she was like, great. And I was like, where's a good medical school? And she was like, well, Harvard's pretty good. And I was like, all right, I want to go to Harvard. And so for my, my whole, you know, adolescent life, I wanted to go to Harvard. I wanted to be a doctor. And then, you know, college applications roll around and I'm, I have the choice between, you know, uh, a couple different universities, um, and I think I was I I was uh, brought off the wait list at Harvard uh, eventually. But by that time, I had received a, a um, acceptance to the University of Chicago, and so I was like, "Well, screw Harvard. I'm going. I'm going to U Chicago." <laughs> like, and and I was lucky because my brother Zach was two years older than me, and he was already at the University of Chicago, um, so he had already done a lot of the legwork. Um, because if I hadn't, if I didn't have him, I wouldn't have known what the hell to do. Right. I mean, that's, that's like you mentioned, a lot of first gen students or a lot of students who, you know, are maybe going to schools like, you know, I went to a public school where, um, you know, when I told the, the guidance counselor where I wanted to apply to college, she laughed at me. She was like, I, I told her, I was like, Harvard, University of Chicago, a couple other places. And she was like, She's like, yeah, that's great. She's like, but let's, let's, you know, let's focus you on like a couple more like local schools. Not that there was anything wrong with those local schools, but it was just like, I was like, I'm, I'm telling you what I want to do. And you think so little of me that you don't even see that as like a possibility. Um, and that can, that can be really damaging to a, to a child, right. Um, or to a, to an adolescent. Um, but again, I was, I think I was very fortunate to have a supportive family um, that, you know, my parents, you know, like a lot of first gen parents, like they were always on me about schoolwork, right? They were always hounding me, um, you know, if I, if I got anything lower than like an A, they would be like, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to end up like, you know, working here or, you know, like you're, you're never going to get to Harvard that way. And so it's kind of, uh, kind of brutal but you know like you know I'm, I'm grateful that I had that support system in the end 
um, when I wasn't getting it from like my high school and stuff like that. And I, and a lot of people don't have that. And so again, it's, it's also important for teachers like yourself and for friends to really provide each other, you know, that, that sort of support, because you never know, um, you never know, you know, how other people are, are telling, you know, your friends and the people sitting next to you in class that they're not good enough. Right. Because again, a lot of us are sitting inside with that but you are good enough, right? I mean, like you, you, every, you're all good enough, you know, it, it's, and there are a lot of different possible futures for you, right? Your life, your happiness and your life does not depend on one set path, right? Because, and, and, you know, I guess I'm, I'm a shining example of that, right? Because I didn't go to Harvard. Um, I went to U Chicago and two years in, uh, I was a, um, a bio major pre-med, and I hated it. <laughs> I just like, I, I love bio and I still love bio, but, um, but I took organic chemistry and it sucked and I, and I sucked at it and I just could not for the life of me get excited about it. <laughs> like, and, and so what's that? That not many people can. I remember organic. the first time I ever got a C ever was organic chemistry. <laughs> okay good well then i don't well you well you're a, you're a you're a doctor in zoology so i don't feel as bad now <laughs> um, people can still um, become who they want to be with a c in organic chemistry so all right so there you go kids yeah like my and michael jordan was cut from his high school basketball team mm -hmm. and Kristen got a c in organic chemistry so like mm -hmm. again it's not you know i know in the time in the moment it's gonna feel like your world is ending it's not right you know like there i felt that way not only when i was waitlisted at harvard i felt that way when i was working at the warehouse after college right after i had gone to u chicago and thought that my world was going to you know that it was all smooth sailing from there Four years later, I'm working 12-hour days as a temp in this warehouse, um, where it's me and a bunch of ex-cons, and and everyone is struggling. And I was no better than them, right? You know, like that's that's the word. I think the really important lesson that I learned was, was like, you know, just because I have an education doesn't mean we're not in an economic crisis, right? You know, like what matters here is the work that I put into it, the camaraderie I build with my coworkers, and we made it through. Um, but yeah, I. I Got to Chicago, um, hated OCHEM, and then two years in, um, you know, I like I said, I always loved literature, but I never thought of it as a life path. It was always kind of more of a hobby. Um, and, you know, I just, I wanted to feel like I was, you know, like you, Chicago, and a lot of other universities, right? They want you to feel like you're in, like, the smartest place in the world where, you know, everyone is a venerable scholar, and this is what all the conversations happening on the on the lawn are brilliant conversation. A lot of them are. A lot of them are, are dumb, but like you know, they're they're still fun to have, right? But like again, uh, you know, it's it, the the perception and the reality is very different. Um, but you know, I I wanted to feel like I was part of that you know brainy academic world, and so when I went home for winter break in my second year, I just I wanted to pick the biggest book on my shelf and read it and it happened to be uh the brothers karamazov by fyodor dostoevsky a russian 19th century russian novelist a brilliant guy y'all may have had to read crime and punishment at one point and i'm gonna take a stab and guess that you probably hated it <laughs> because like you know i hated dostoevsky in high school because i i a our i don't think our teacher taught Dostoevsky very well and B it was a bad translation like I you know we just focused on all the boring parts but there's so much in these books that that really is exciting and and interesting and mind-opening so anyway I picked this big book by Dostoevsky I started reading it I got really engrossed in it and then I found out there was a whole class on that one book in uh, when I came back to college in the winter and so I had an elective I decided to take it the professor was a really nice guy. He knew that I was this bio Mexican, you know, bio major Mexican kid. Um, but he was like, yeah, sure, you know, come on in. And he kind of took me under his wing. He encouraged me. He's another person who was a big influence on me because he, he told me that I belonged there, right? And he encouraged me to feel like I belonged in that classroom and that I had something worth saying. Uh, I had something worth 
contributing to this great work of literature that had been around for over a century. Like that's a really powerful thing for, for a young person to hear. Um, and, you know, I just fell so in love with reading um, and thinking critically and getting into these kinds of discussions that by the end of that year, I remember I was sitting in a, in a study session for, you know, a big uh, exam in chemistry. And I just, all I could think about was the stack of Russian novels on my desk in my dorm room and what order I wanted to read them in once this test was over, once we were on break. And I kind of, I got up, I walked out and I called my parents and I was like, hey, how upset would you guys be if I switched from bio pre-med to Russian literature? <laughs> and like, to their credit, they took it about as well as I think you can because to them, I don't think it was as big of a surprise as it was to me. They were like, they always knew that I was like a, you know, a poetic guy. Like I had always, I've been writing since I was a kid and I loved, I loved books. So like, it didn't seem like so out of left field, but committing to that as like, this is what I want to do. I want to be in this world. I want to be a professor. I want to, I want to write about this kind of stuff. You know, it was, it was really invigorating. And that's kind of the path that I've gone down as I, I majored in Russian literature at U Chicago. I, I ended up getting a master's in England in Russian literature. Um, I probably should have gone to Russia, but like there for for I had friends in England. I knew the university, so I went there for a year. Then I came back, and that's when everything went to to you know everything fell apart, and and um, the recession was in full swing. And that's when I was working at the warehouses and and stuff like that. Then I was a waiter in Chicago. Um, and then eventually I kind of decided to apply to graduate schools. Um, and then I went to Michigan where I, I study kind of, uh, Mexican, Russian and U S kind of literature in the 20th century, like the ways that they, these authors moved between the, like the Soviet union, going to Mexico, going to the U S right. What they learned from each other, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's pretty much how it shook out. So there's no one set path, I guess is what I'm is what I'm saying because even then when I went to grad school and I started studying this stuff to get a PhD and I was like now I want to be a professor. I'm not a professor now. Like it was it was I also thought my life was ending when I didn't get a professorship job. Mm -hmm. But then I got this job at the Chronicle and I'm very happy here. So like it's very hard to see the forest from the trees, you know, and, and I, you know, this isn't to minimize or say that what, you know, when you're experiencing that, it's not, you know, a lot to go through, but, you know, there, there are more, there's more than one path to being the person that you want to be. If you could go back in time and give your high school or your middle school self advice, what would it be? <laughs> You know, I, I have thought about this in the past um, because, you know, I guess another conversion story, right, is that I, I grew up very Catholic, very conservative um, in Southern California. Um, and now, you know, I'm, I'm like a, a left-wing nut job. I'm like the red sheep of the family, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, I guess I'm more, I'm more, I'm more politically on the left. Um, but, you know, a lot of my family's still conservative. You know, I, I, you know, talk to a lot of workers who are conservative or in the middle, some who are, you know, more on the left. But, you know, sometimes I, I, I thought to myself, if I could go back and talk to like my, you know, senior year self, who was like, you know, Mr. Popular, uh, I was, like I said, I was in like uh, student government, bas varsity basketball, like uh, prom court, all that stuff. And like, it seemed like I had achieved what I want. Yeah. I was nominated to prom court for, for some reason. Um, and, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, part of me has thought that if I could go back and, and kind of see like, Hey, you know, your, your politics, you know, are going to develop in, in a certain way, you know, like, you know, maybe you should start reading this or that, you know, maybe because as a, as a conservative person, it wasn't, it wasn't my conservatism that was the problem. It was that I saw people in such reductive terms, right? And that meshed with 
with like my conservative upbringing, right? Because I was taught to see only, you know, my own interests, only, only what I needed out of the world. Like everyone else's problems weren't my concern, right? And everyone else's problems could be solved by if they just worked harder, you know, if they just, if they just put in the effort that I did sort of thing, right? Again, then life happened. Then, you know, my, my dad, who was also conservative, like, we, we experienced, we lost everything, right? You know, and even though he had worked harder than anyone I had ever known, right? And I, I started to realize through that and especially through literature, right? Through literature, through Dostoevsky, because the reason his books are so long is because there are so many people in them, right? There's so many characters. There's so much experience that he writes into these worlds that he creates, right? And he really thinks hard about the the different sorts of lives that people lead and what they look like when they all kind of come together in this big novel that's what that's what the novel is right and and to do that you have to again like i said you have to think outside of your own head you have to try to imagine what the world looks like outside of your own eye sockets and that's a very hard thing to do and it's not something we're encouraged to do very often in our lives everything is about us and and the classes we're taking, the extracurriculars we're doing, the colleges that we want to go through. And that, you know, that's important, right? But, but there, it leaves very little time, especially in, when you're, you know, a teenager. It leaves very little time to think about other people. And, and I didn't very often. Like, it was, I was so focused on all of my AP classes and extracurriculars and whatnot that, you know, I, I didn't, take enough time to see people in that sort of complex way that I, I try to do now. And literature really helped me with that, you know, along with all the life experiences and that I had and the people that I met and the places that I went, like I basically just learned to see the world with all of its beautiful complexity. And then I started to realize that people were, were you know, more complicated than how I had thought about them. And that also led me to believe that you know, if I could go back and talk to my, like, high school self, I would say the two things are interlinked. Is one, you know, people are more complicated than you think, and respect that, right? Just respect it. Don't, don't make snap judgments of people. But also, um, you know, don't forget to, to give yourself that kindness, right? Don't forget, you know, that you are still a very complicated person, and that's okay. That's good, Right? You don't have to just be one or two things, right? You can be multiple things at once, right? You can explore what, you know, your desires are, right? You can, and, and in so doing, I think what I would really tell my high school self is like, don't, don't worry so much about what you think other people are expecting of you, right? You know, because that, that was a really kind of crushing that, that was a really kind of crushing weight, I think, on me. And, and I feel like for as much as I did explore, you know, different extracurriculars and, and stuff in high school, I think there were still a lot of experiences that I missed out on and um, a lot of time that I perhaps lost because I was so focused on pleasing other people and being who I thought they wanted me to be. And, um, and I didn't really, you know, that never quite felt like me. And, and it was like, it wasn't until the years ahead that I think I would really start to um, care more, you know, like about what I wanted and, and about um, how I wanted to live in the world, not just, you know, how other people wanted me to do that. Wow. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. This has been really amazing. I even learned a lot about you. I didn't know you were a biology major and I didn't know you wrote a high school newspaper. And so this was really insightful for me. You said a lot of powerful things that I'm going to take away from this. So I can only imagine what it's like for a young person to hear these kind of messages. Um, you are such an inspiration to me. I don't know if you know this, me and my husband talk about you all the time. You're one of our favorite things to talk about because we both really love you. Uh, you are a gem in our lives, but you are just a really special person and you are authentic and inspiring and honest and compassionate. And I'm really fortunate to have you in my life. I'm really excited that 
you had the time and I really appreciate it. And I get to kind of have this conversation with you and record it and share it out to young people. And I think you're gonna be really inspiring to a lot of people, so. Thank you, I appreciate that. And your students are very lucky to have you and I love you guys too. Yeah. <laughs> I love them so much. I miss them so much. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for listening. Thanks. Thanks for having me.